Our first speaker is Dr. Paul Marshall, um, who virtually everyone knows in this space, um, who is a professor, um, Wilson Professor of Religious Freedom at Baylor University, as well as a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute um, in Religious Freedom in Washington, D.C. He has written and edited over 20 books, one of which is actually the book that got me personally interested in working on um, international religious freedom. So with that, introduce uh, Paul. Okay. Uh Thank you very much, Lindsay. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sending again. So, um, the, um, uh, uh, time is short, so I'm, I'm going to make um, my statements in, in point form. I want to give, firstly, a general overview of the dynamics of apostasy and blasphemy accusation um, in the world, and then make some particular comments on um, Egypt. Uh, first thing to say is that, <clears throat> I think this audience knows this already, <clears throat> but the incident which, <coughs> excuse me, I'm terribly sorry, get international attention, attacks on uh, Charlie Hebdo, for example, the Danish cartoon, Koran burning now in Sweden, um, are, they get international coverage, but they are atypical. Most of the cases are very different. In terms of the other cases, a worldwide pattern is the accusations made against people, either by the state or by society, are usually very vague. It could be fighting against God, propagating spiritual liberalism, insulting a heavenly religion, and so on. So, uh, vague accusations. <coughs> Secondly, such accusations are often shaped by political manipulation. To give one example, the Danish cartoons, if you ask people what happened there, um, they say, well, these cartoons were published and then there were riots and outbreaks in Pakistan and Afghanistan and people were killed. This isn't true. The cartoons came out in September 2005 with not much response. Um, but the Organization of the Latin Conference decided to make it an issue in its January 2006 conference, and then six months later, the riots broke out. <coughs> that didn't mean Muslims were not uh, insulted by the cartoons, but usually when you get a sort of explosion of anger, it's because somebody's interested in it happening. So, uh, Vague accusations, political manipulation. Thirdly, while governments can be dangerous, most of the victims of blasphemy or apostasy accusations are attacked by terrorists or by civil society. Uh, you, you suffer more danger, usually from mobs, than the governments. And then fourthly and finally, um, I would say there are four major classes of victims. One I will call sort of actual apostates, we see uh, many photographs on the walls here, people who, who have uh, converted from Islam, become Christians or perhaps atheists, and they are often attacked, uh, beaten, sometimes killed, imprisoned by the state and so on. That's one category. A second category is I'll use the term post-Islamic beliefs. Uh, this uh, in particular refers to Baha'i and also to the Ahmadi. Uh, and they're regarded as heretical in, and in that sense, uh, in what they're doing, they're, they're blaspheming. They're blaspheming. A third category would be Muslims of the quote, wrong type. I'm not saying they're wrong, but if you're a minority Muslim in the setting. So uh, Sunni Muslims, particularly the Sufi variety, can have difficulty in um, Iran, uh, whereas Shia can have difficulty in, um, say, Egypt and many other places. With these two latter categories I mentioned, the post-Islamic beliefs and Muslims of the quote, wrong type, uh, these include the vast majority of the victims of apostasy and blasphemy accusations. I would say here we're dealing 
between four and five million people in those, because uh, collectively they are accused of that. Uh, another category is Muslim religious and political reformers and dissidents. And they are often targeted and said to be heretical because they disagree with the dominant form of Islam where they are. This is particularly a problem in that these are the people who are often, often defenders of other religious minorities. Some cases are just mentioned too. Finally, in Egypt, uh, Nagib Mahfouz, no Arabic writer, you should read his book, Nobel Prize winner. He was attacked not by the government, uh, but by uh, radicals, and, and was stabbed and partially paralyzed because he was writing. Or Hafez uh, Abu Zat, an uh, old friend of mine, who, he had a chapter in the book about it. Uh, because of some of his writings uh, dealing with the Quran, um, he was threatened by the Muslim Brotherhood with legal action. India had, had to flee to Egypt. So what happens is that uh, many of the Muslims who are most likely to be allies of particularly minorities and those accused of radical apostasy are themselves silenced by these very same laws. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think that was a really helpful uh, start to the to the event, just to lay out the kind of the broad scope of what we're dealing with with both apostasy and blasphemy laws. Um, our next speaker is Andrew Walda, who became the executive director for Jubilee Campaign in 1991 when she launched the organization. Um, she also started Just Law. Um, which is an immigration law firm. And um, by way of personal introduction as well, Anne has been um, one of the best mentors to those of us learning about international religious freedom, I would say for many years, um, who certainly taught me a lot and been an excellent partner. Um, so I can see here, I'm gonna have, I'm sorry. Here. Okay. Just the time, the PowerPoint's not quite in the right place. But um, uh, let's uh, welcome Anne. It's a pleasure to uh, address you this morning. One of the topics that often occurs as Dr. Marshall had explained, when you have a, those accused of apostasy or blasphemy who manage to evade their death sentence, and oftentimes they have to flee. Where do they flee to? Uh, that's oftentimes where organizations, NGOs come into play, or even private citizens, but to find out somebody has fled or a group of people have fled um, how can we assist them? Uh, as was noted, I practice immigration law here in the United States. I'm also um, on the board of Refugee Council USA, which is the board primarily uh, of organizations that do resettlement to the United States. And I mention that to say, uh, there has been uh, a lot of effort to increase the number of refugees that are actually resettled. Globally, the number of refugees are well into the millions. Of those you know, aggregate numbers, religious refugees are actually a very small portion. Um, it's not usually divided into specific numbers that, that are published because oftentimes the reason for the claim for refugee resettlement is not disclosed. Whereas race is disclosed, country is disclosed, uh, what's not disclosed is uh, the, 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 the reason for it. So um, it's more anecdotal to say it would be a small percent of those uh, who are seeking resettlement. Uh, now, uh, there are, again, specific populations. We know amongst the Afghan refugees, there are religious minorities. Those are Hazaras, which are uh, predominantly uh, Shia in an otherwise Taliban-controlled country, which is Sunni-controlled now in Afghanistan. So 
the Hazaris are terrified. They are fleeing uh, into neighboring Iran, which is also Shia, but they're also fleeing elsewhere, trying to find peace and safety. And also there is um, in the tens of thousands, um, probably 10,000, 15,000, I should say, uh, converts to Christianity from Afghanistan. Many organizations have been trying to assist them. Uh, we've continued to work with Ambassador Brownback. Um, now the meetings are about once a month. At one point, they were twice a week, trying to figure out how do we resettle these minority uh, religious groups from um, Afghanistan. And the challenge, again, is the Shia is in the millions, and then there's 10 to 15 thousand uh, converts to Christianity. You also have um, uh, those who are other minority faiths, but it's very um, small numbers. Well, what can we do to help them uh, as organizations? And uh, one of the things I wanted to point out that um, uh, most of the people who are fleeing for their faith um, do have contacts with NGOs and organizations to help them. Um, and they're trying to, to find resettlement, usually in, in, in a Western country or a safe third, third haven country. Um, getting them introduced into that process traditionally has been through the UN High Commission for Refugees, the UNHCR. Um, regrettably, because of COVID and other factors, UNHCR processing is almost ground down to a standstill. Um, another issue is that the United States, having traditionally been the major resettlement country in the past 80,000 80, to 100,000, um, under the Trump administration, it was dwindled down to 20,000 bringing refugees from abroad. And now uh, under the Biden administration, there's even less such refugees. Um, and again, the portion of religious minorities is even smaller. Um, so what are people doing at the moment? Um, I hate to say it, uh, you know, trying to get into the United States through the southern border, which uh, the Biden administration's focus has been on the southern border um, and managing the migration that's taking place there. Many of those come into the U.S. and become asylum seekers, uh, which is a distinction from walking through the refugee resettlement process. Well, there has been pressure from Refugee Council USA and other organizations on the Biden administration to increase. Uh, and that is because what's regrettably happened is there's so few um, uh, migrants, and I should say immigrants, refugee seekers that of religious minorities that have an avenue to come in. For instance, Pakistani Christians who have fled blasphemy charges from Pakistan are stuck in Thailand. There's still well over 5,000 who've been there now five to six years. I started working on this in 2015. Almost none get approved by the UNHCR. And then even if they do get approved, uh, almost none are resettled in the United States for the reasons I've already referenced. So what can be done to help them? There are some new programs. I want you to be aware of Welcome Corps. Welcome Corps is specifically targeting refugees. And what they're attempting to do, the Biden administration is trying to say, we need private sponsorship. The first 10,000, uh, the first phase is now being rolled out as of uh, about 10 days ago it was announced. The first 10,000 of those are supposed to be refugees in the pipeline. If you don't have a choice, the administration will make that choice for you through Populations, Refugees and Migrations Office, PRM. Now, um, the second and third phases, beyond the second phase, organizations will be able to choose uh, refugees to resettle. They'll be able to make referrals. So keep that in mind. Um, and again, for the sake of time, I can't go into the details of the Welcome Corps. You can Google about it. Uh, but it is set up to be in phases. And, and I think there's a real opportunity that's going to come forward in the next year or two in terms of organizations being able to privately sponsor. Um, and one last point on that before I conclude my remarks. Um, and that would be 
what a lot of organizations end up doing is seeking uh, a mechanism known as humanitarian parole. Um, and once again, this is an avenue where ministries and organizations that are assisting uh, refugees, asylum seekers, those who have fled, when their cases are significantly strong enough, well documented, these are prime candidates for seeking, at least in the United States, something known as humanitarian parole. And that is something to, to keep in mind. And there are organizations that are assisting with that process. You can contact me and I can put you in touch with organizations that are, are working uh, in that realm to do and have identified particular refugees. Uh, that are, you know, fleeing because of their religious faith. We certainly would want to assist them. So um, I look forward to questions at, in the Q&A time, and thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you, Anne. Um, that, was, that was very helpful for those of us who uh, maybe are less aware of the opportunities for um, assisting refugees uh, through the United Nations and also with laws here in the United States. Um, <clears throat> at this point in the program, we're going to be hearing from uh, individuals from a few different countries that are highly impacted by blasphemy and apostasy laws. Um, our next speaker is Kola Alpini, an international human rights lawyer from Nigeria. Um, he is the lead um, of a legal team who has uh, helped free um, a number of individuals who have been accused and um, were given death sentences for blasphemy. Unfortunately, he was able to get some of those overturned. So we look forward to hearing um, about the situation in Nigeria.
Shoda, you painted quite a, a sobering picture that we have so much work to do. Um, our next speaker is Mohammed Zayed, who is the founder and executive director of Ex-Muslims of North America. Um, this is the very first ex-Muslim advocacy organization in North America, um, and their focus is on normalizing religious dissent and promoting acceptance of secularism in Muslim communities. So, we realize that that is certainly, you have your hands full, I guess we could say. But I also, um, I believe that you bring a, a much needed perspective, Muhammad, um, from somebody who was formerly Muslim who has lived this personally. So the floor is just up to share.
his funeral was attended by hundreds of thousands. A mosque was built to celebrate him. And the mosque was not large enough to house the number of people that came to his worship. And a second mosque was being built. People in Pakistan can't, or well, most Muslim countries that have these worship houses can't speak out. Um, it's the obligation of those of us that are outside of those countries that have freedom of speech, freedom of thought to speak out about these issues. Um, that's what the Hope for organization is. Um, one case that we worked on over here um, was a young 16 year old guy in DC. He left the faith, he was an atheist. Um, at 15, he told the founders, like most people who knew the founders about the Sanitarium program, and aren't wow. afraid of the founders. He, he was locked up in his own home in DC, um, at Fairfax actually. He was beaten, um, his entire family got together to perform an exorcism, and uh, they believed that there's no way somebody could actually demean his son, the only way is he was possessed. Um, they beat him to an end of his life, and they themselves were so horrified by how violent they had acted that they paused during the beat. And that moment, he ran away. Um, so we uh, created a, a series of documentaries about um, ex-Muslims uh, that have gone through such experiences. One of the cases we profiled was Jamal. As a result of that, um, Muslim imams talked about this issue, um, about how they're failing their community. So. By highlighting these cases and by, and by empowering um, the centers, particularly people like me that come from Muslim background and have a Muslim family, um, it becomes much harder to actually demonize us. Um, in Pakistan, going back to Pakistan, 65% uh, uh, there was a huge poll from 2013 that about 65% of Pakistanis believe that killing those that leave Islam is justified. So in this society, um, unless the bedrock uh, ideas that animate that society are changed, um, you repeatedly come back to blasphemy and apostasy laws, must, as, as well as vigilante violence. Um, so our perspective is we need to change the hearts and minds of Muslims themselves by challenging them, by uh, helping those that are in the closet to come out. There was a few poll um, of US Muslims that 23% of those raised Muslim in America have left the faith. Similar numbers um, exist from other countries around the world. In Tunisia, it's about 18%. Even in Saudi Arabia, 5% of those surveyed are atheists. So allowing or providing them the ability to speak up about these issues changes the dynamic. And Muslims, uh, Muslim parents in particular, recognize this. They recognize the growing danger of atheists or disbelievers uh, of apostates speaking up. Um, there was a program on Saudi TV where <laughs> Um, a preacher had said that uh, first they wanted to question, uh, want to be able to debate whether Islam is true or not, whether Christianity or Judaism is true or not. Then they would want freedom of thought, freedom of speech. In the end, they would question everything. And once you have, like in our society, freedom of speech, you can question, you can challenge, you can um, change minds. Um, in uh, most Muslim countries, it must take violence in view. In Pakistan, for example, is one of the most egregious examples. Um, in the 1980s, a law was passed uh, called the Lugo Amendment, which um, if a woman is raped um, and can't prove the rape, she is charged with adultery and uh, imprisoned for life. Uh, in the early 2000s, um, uh, Pakistan was an anti-military dictatorship, and due to international pressure, they wanted to repeal parts of those laws. In Pakistani law, uh, there was a religious council that oversees all laws to make sure they comply with Islam. Um, they initially approved this, to repeal that. And there was widespread protests around the country. Uh, a reformer, Javed Bambi, had to resign due to support of repealing the law. Within a few years, he had to flee the country due to death threats. He and his neighbors left. He didn't take them back. The reason he left was he was not afraid for his life. His neighbors were afraid for theirs, that they would be caught in the violence. And this is a Muslim cleric that was part of the government, um, simply for supporting the repeal of uh, the Hulu or so if there's no space for people to speak up, to reform, to challenge, to even debate whether they can change certain laws, how can we presume that change can ever happen? Um, so going back to my personal point, we need to change the hearts and minds. That's where the long-term solution for this is, to challenge Muslims that 
um, are either unaware of these laws or are on the peripheral basis on these, or by humanizing those of us that have left, by speaking up in our own pockets, in our own families, in our own neighborhoods. Thank you very much. That was a powerful message, Mohammed. And uh, for those of you, if you haven't um, been on the ex Muslim of North America website, they have some incredible resources that um, may be helpful in your work, um, as well as some of the uh, personal stories of ex Muslims. Um, our next speaker also has a focus on Pakistan, uh, Joseph Jansen. Uh, he is a human rights advocacy officer with the Relief Campaign. Um, and he has been touched very personally by uh, blasphemy laws in Pakistan through the imprisonment of his sister and brother-in-law um, who were accused of blasphemy and imprisoned for eight years. Um, so he is also somebody who, um, who has been working very hard to address the situation in a, in a practical way. Um, and I look forward to hearing uh, about your experiences. Thank you so much. My name is Joseph Jansen, and I'm uh, working with the Green Campaign. Uh, I'm also brother of Shukta Kauser, who spent eight years in Pakistan, uh, falsely accused of blasphemy, and she was announced to a uh, death sentence. And finally, with all efforts of us, all NGOs, human rights activists, multiple organizations like the Green Campaign, ADF International, many organizations, did a lot of efforts to, uh, for their acquittal, for their relief, and we are very thankful. Pakistan is a country with a state religion Islam, which so serves as a source to devising policies, drafting laws, and issuing judgment on, base of, on the basis of Islam. The religious minorities face discrimination on the basis of faith, which is reflected in the false allegations uh, of blasphemy, defaming, of, 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 uh, for example, uh, uh, desecration of Quran or of mob violence, attacking on churches, attacking on individuals. The lack of action by the state authorities to prevent religious, religiously motivated discrimination and violence lead to increased social hostility <coughs> and affected religious freedom conditions from for all minorities. The state authorities failed to ensure equality, right to freedom for all, and opportunity to ensure religious freedom for all. Today, I'm going to talk about two major issues in Pakistan, like apostasy and blasphemy laws. Apost apostasy in Pakistan. Pakistan's constitution uh, guarantees in Article 20 to choose any religion, to accept any religion, or follow any religion. However, in practices, it is not in the same way. In practices in Pakistan, Pakistan's government official authority, national database authority, which issues identity card, passports, registered birth certificate uh, has instructions, has put instructions on it, and they have prohibited Muslims to convert to any other religion. Pakistan's population, around 220 million, 22 million people, have no freedom to choose any other religion, like these people cannot become atheists, cannot become a Hindu cannot choose, they don't have choice. They don't have choice to leave Islam. So it is not that they can simply convert to Christianity, they cannot choose any other religion. So the freedom of 2200 million is on the line on the basis of instructions by the state, by the government, putting instructions on these people, prohibiting them. One of the cases that I want to discuss is a woman, her name is Nora, who was born as a Christian, as a Muslim, sorry, and she fell in love with the other religion person man, and she got married with him. But however, when she got two children, her two children, 
in the age of five, six, and they wanted to go to the school and wanted to register her uh, birth certificate, make her identity card in Pakistan. And when she went to the Nadra office, like government office, at the government building, it was very big poster hanged on the government building saying that leaving Islam to any other religion is prohibited and there is a punishment. So when she saw that there is a punishment, it's apostasy, it is connected with apostasy. Pakistan, if whoever will leave Islam to any other religion, consider as apostasy, which is blasphemy. Consider blasphemy, carries death penalty. When she saw this in Urdu language, she turned back to her home and till today, she does not have any identity card of citizen Pakistan. Her children do not have birth certificate, do not have any identity. They cannot go to school. They not, cannot start their normal life in Pakistan. So they are fighting, living in Pakistan without Pakistani citizen. Without, they, their children cannot start. So we are trying to, however, help both to make this possible, but legally, there, there are instructions by the government. And the same way, in blasphemy, blasphemy Pakistan is a country which carries blasphemy laws from section 295B till 295H. From 295B is defaming Quran or any religious pages carries imprisonment for life, life imprisonment. 295C is defaming or saying something against Prophet is a blasphemy which carries death penalty mandatory in Pakistan. Whoever, these laws has been often used, misused on a, on a base of dispute, like I'm on a work, I, I'm in the field, a CBB's case, like she was also, you know, working in the field, a simple argument, on a simple argument or any dispute any majority religion can person can say that you did you said something against Islam or against religion and they can easily misuse this law to settle personal vendetta dispute business rivalries or any other grudges properties maybe I my business is going well and other person is jealous because of my business they can easily use these laws to settle their personal grudges and we have seen hundreds and hundreds uh, example of the misuse uh, of blasphemy laws in Pakistan and my own sister was the victim of it and she spent eight years in the darkness of the prison. How? So blasphemy, it is very important that we understand that our government of Pakistan understand that Pakistan, the people how it used uh, to settle their personal vendetta. It is therefore important that we, as international advocates, international organizations, raise this our voice and recommend Pakistan to repeal blasphemy laws and guarantee Article 20 for 2200, 220 million people to give freedom to choose any religion. In the end, I would just like to give my recommendation for blasphemy that Pakistan must amend blasphemy laws, particularly in section 295B till 295C to disproportionately uh, repealing death penalty and 295B make bearable offense. Some of the offense are not available, like you commit the crime, you cannot even, you don't have even right to have the bail. Secondly, I want to uh, mention uh, about that international community. Recently, Pakistan, sorry, has increased the, it is very important that I, in the end, mention Pakistan in 2021, uh, 2022, large number of they are uh, in Sindh, they face flood, there is a hunger, 
uh, there is an electricity problem, there is a lot of Pakistan at the edge of uh, economical crisis. Same time, rather than doing something better for its citizen, Pakistan's National Assembly has increased the punishment on blasphemy law in 17, on 17 January 2023. So National Assembly, Assembly, rather than to help its citizen to providing food, giving them security, making new houses in the, in the flooded area, it is, they have been busy increasing punishment on blasphemy laws. So this is, this, is, this is very serious for the minorities because this gets misused. I urge the national community to talk about this so that Pakistan uh, uh, Senate or other uh, relevant uh, institutes oppose this bill. Thank you so much. Can you hear us? Okay, welcome. Um, shall we have you on video or just audio? <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There we go, perfect. Welcome. Actually, 
um, um, students who are having participation in one of the combat and tend to the attack is facing from even like not getting any support from any from even to prepare for the place to welcome him because he's not really considered you know terrible person. This is really hard to me because uh, when I look back on my case, I wasn't uh, visiting the doctor. I wasn't. I did not convert. I was arrested from the comfort of my home. So this can happen to anyone, you know. And and we don't have to look at, to attack people with their personality or character. We have to put out most of our hope. Why is this happening? And why they stop this law that is um, restrict very restriction. Um, people's choices on marriage or in um, practicing their faith or peace or prayer, you know? So that's the, um, a little bit of what I want to say today. So I also want to speak about um, this specific individual that we have been faced with this particular threat when it comes to conversion, and it was a woman. So especially, you know, of course it can last from it all, and it doesn't have to be conversion. Again, like my kids, uh, when I, I have to testify because my testimony wasn't, uh, um, you know, enough for the judge to convince the judge that he's supposed to take my word because I am a woman. And, and there is only so the testimony of one, two women equal one man. So no one can testify on your own. To, to support my testimony, say no, she's a Christian because it's not, you know, um, what I would say, it's not acceptable by the court. I have to say I'm not, I'm a woman, so I am, uh, uh, my testimony is not enough to convince the judge. So, like, you are invisible. You stand there in front of the judge, but you don't have a voice. You don't have, uh, you know, your words are not being taken into consideration because you are a woman. So this is um, something also I want to highlight. And uh, again, um, despite every, you know, negative comment when it comes to our uh, prejudice and Islam Sharia law, we only want to get to justice. And justice cannot happen when the truth is being, you know, uh, minimized or, or um, people who speak in the truth are sensitized or taking their seat. Because we have to look at this. There's not any person who happened to convert from Islam to any faith or to, you know, to just to denounce Islam. It happened to have normal life after. Many of us. It seems like in this moment we face threat, we face criticism, and, and it's not just about the individual. Like you made a choice to to practice your belief different way than what you're supposed to do according to the law in your country. Now your life is no longer in the same. You either have to be forced to leave your country and come to the West, and then you have to face a different. Uh, Persecution because you're not be allowed to speak the truth, you're not be allowed to share your story. Because what it happened in the West here, when it comes to Islam Sharia law, we call this Islamophobia, or hateful, all this stuff. But we don't really hear and listen to these stories with our heart. If we want to change, we must focus and listen to these stories with our heart and understand. Not to re just listen to response or debate because you know we kind of debate everything. No. You are wrong about this, I am right about this. This is not about wrong or right, this is about people's life, about, um, you know, family safety, like, you know, our community. And um, my children are considered illegitimate, but we're not on the way to go after them. This is serious thing, I and mean, it can happen to any of us, anywhere, even in the West now. Thank you so much, Mariam. Um, we are running a, a little bit short on time, so I think I'm going to offer one of two options to our speakers. Um, if you would like to make a closing statement, if there's a point that you think was missed that you would like to, um, to quickly share, um, that's great. And then I do have a, a quick question if you would prefer to answer a question instead. 
Um, <clears throat> following up on what Mariam said about the, the inability to choose for yourself, um, obviously that's the, the heart of apostasy and blasphemy issue, but <clears throat> what is it that you think causes governments and religious leaders to prefer that people uh, fake being a believer um, or to not come forward, to stay in the closet, how, however you'd like to phrase that. What is it that they prefer with that as opposed to letting people actually express their, their true personal beliefs? And then, you know, that leads to questions like, how do we know how many people truly are practicing believing um, Muslims, let's say, uh, because if everyone is forced and doesn't have a choice, then we don't know if they would stay or if they would leave. To me, that seems like a, a something that a government who is, is concerned about control would want to know, but rather than having that truth, they hide it. And um, maybe especially a question for Mohammed, um, why do some governments consider atheists and agnostics more dangerous than people who convert, let's say, from Islam to Christianity or to another faith? And I know, um, particularly in Egypt, um, uh, we've actually seen public statements <coughs> by Egyptian officials saying, an atheist we will go after more than any other type of believer. What is what is that difference? So, if you'd like to answer any of those questions, or just to make a brief, uh, brief closing statement, that would be great. And thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I've got another thing at nine thirty, so I'll, I'll just go first. And just one point to to make: um, there is, and I think all the people on this platform and most in in the audience would know that there is a. So growing international network, including a governmental network, opposing blasphemy laws, and that has been expanding. So if, if that's not something you're aware of or involved in, I would encourage you to do that. It's, um, it needs that type of pressure. Somewhere like Pakistan would, would be a harder nut to crack. Um, but several countries which have uh, draconian blasphemy laws um, have softened them, in some cases dropped them within the last decade. So there is movement on this score. Um, in, in addition to the comments I made earlier with regard to refugees, uh, uh, asylum seekers, and so forth, um, I think that there are other avenues where you can support people who are fleeing. And I think one of the things they need more than, than even potentially legal help is just practical help of assisting them with shelters and assisting them in other ways. Um, and once again, there is a new program that has been announced uh, to assist um, those who are in third countries uh, with, with aid and, and uh, provide provision. And, there, and I know the US government is looking for partners to do that. So I wanted to, to, to reference that. Um, I'm not the expert, although I have opinions on some of the other questions raised by um, our moderator, I, I'm going to refrain from answering them uh, because they'd be opinion rather than personal experience. So I guess we'll see. I just need to. Uh, I just wanted to add more uh, to to apostasy law in Pakistan. Like apostasy law, officially uh, there is not any law which uh, which which is considered like as a crime to to change your religion from Islam to any other religion. However, leaving Islam is a is a pro 
apostasy considered as a blasphemer. So blasphemy laws are applied to those who, who leave Islam and choose any religion which, is, which carries death penalty in Pakistan, mandatory death penalty. That's what I wanted to add. And second, recently what government national assembly has increased the punishment from uh, on uh, blasphemy laws is from uh, is like saying anything against the saints, any who are belonging to Prophet Muhammad, his family or his wives, other saints. Was the punishment was three years now from uh, 17th January, Pakistan National Assembly has passed the, the bill, uh, which is from three years to life imprisonment, which is a real threat for other religious minorities because this can be easily misused and uh, for person, uh, other minority citizen uh, could face real threats for life imprisonment. So that's what I wanted to just a little bit more uh, clear. And m mindset, it is actually of the people who are, uh, wh whoever leave the people, citizens, normal people take the law into their own hands. They feel that see the threat to Islam uh, and they want to be more dominant in their own country on the basis of their religion, Islam, so that we are more dominant. Whoever will leave this, we will, uh, you know, uh, uh, take hold of it or take law into our own hands. There has been more violence, a lot of killing, even own family member, the person who leave Islam and choose any other religion with his own freedom choice, his own family members, brothers, fathers, sisters, uh, family members will first come to kill and register an FIR against him or her. Thank you. Thank you. 
what I was going to say is uh, on the line is that sometimes we really don't, in the deep side of control, there's only so much we can do. We need your help. And we need it now. You guys are the ones who amplify the student activity issues very well and the tuition and the assessment fees and all of that. And then ADF, of course, <laughs> came in with the financial muscle <laughs> <laughs> and legal expertise. And you cannot uh, underestimate it. This makes a difference in every last one there. Um, and we, we, we thank you all and we ask for more support there. There's so many other places that, are, that have not become prominent uh, and people are dying every day. Um, it is not from, from, from blasphemy, it's from poor administration. Church leaders are being um, sacrificed from the police, from the people of Pentecost. One of the to a close, there's some other questions that people need to get to. Um, but before we close, uh, I would be remiss at the beginning to not recognize those who organized this event. Uh, Jubilee Campaign Netherlands, Jubilee Campaign USA, and Set My People Free um, put in all of the effort for this. So we thank you. And um, for those who are watching online, if you have any questions, please check out the websites of the organizations of the speakers. And we hope that you will continue to join us in advocating. Thank you.